Welcome to The Social Podcast, where no discussion or debate is off limits. Uh, Hello and welcome to The Social! Sit down to brass tacks, journalist and speaker, huh? Far in the side. She's back with us today. We're very excited about that. So have you heard of the 4B movement? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Might say that's Women a no. are swearing off sex and dating to protest or, or abortion bans and misogyny after Trump's election win. So they're using slogans like, don't spread for red. <laughs> and Ooh, no Lord. nut November. <laughs> so what do you think, you guys, of this growing interest in, in this form of protest? First of all, okay, who knew that Trump was going to be the best prophylactic that exists? <laughs> <laughs> like, their bingo card. You know, I think that, I, and I don't know if this is going to sound anti-feminist, I, I don't really believe in this movement, and I'll tell you why. I think we're in a place right now where everything is divided, everyone is divided, yeah. right? And this just stokes division further. It's mm -hmm. just, I feel like it, it can quickly turn into an I hate men movement. Mm -hmm. And also, Trump is not paying attention. He doesn't know this is happening. It's right. He doesn't even read his like briefing notes. He's not gonna know about this. And and you know what he does pay attention to though? What? what? He pays attention to crowd size. So go march on Washington. Oh, that's oh, interesting. Right? Okay. That's how you're gonna get his attention. Interesting. That's very interesting. Not, interesting. not having yeah. sex. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, what's interesting to me is that this is nothing new. Sex strikes have been around mm -hmm. since ancient Greece. Oh I my feel God. like you yeah, I'm looking at you, oh my right? God. <laughs> Protesting the Peloponnesian War. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But the thing is, is that like my sense is that they aren't especially effective. Yeah. Um, recently in 2019, Alyssa Milano, you know, she was at the helm of the Me Too movement in many cases. Mm -hmm. And she took to Twitter to protest. She wrote, join me by not having sex until we get bodily autonomy back, until women have legal control over our own bodies. We just cannot risk pregnancy. Of course, this was in reaction to the abortion bans in the United States. Did that do anything? Like, you need en masse a whole bunch of women to agree to this and stick to it in order for this to have any effect. And I think the other piece of this is, like, it makes the assumption that um, women only have sex, what, to, like, please their man? Yeah. Is that the only reason we have mm. sex? And is yeah. it only this kind? I don't know if I can do that justice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they can. We get it, we get it. Is it only yeah, yeah. one kind of sex? So it brings it, I just think it's not very effective. Yeah, no, I, listen, I appreciate what these women are doing in Korea, but I'm noticing a different type of protest, and it's almost an anti-protest. Listen, historically, black women have been at the forefront of a lot of protests, whether it is to protect people's voting rights, their health care, or the killing of unarmed black men and uh, brown men. And I think the results of this landslide win by Donald Trump sent a very clear message to black women, which is, first of all, America's not ready for a woman in the White House, and they definitely aren't ready for a black woman in the, in the White House, even if she is overqualified and up against uh, an accused mm -hmm. rapist mm -hmm. and someone who's been impeached twice and a convicted felon. And so what I'm noticing is from a lot of my black girlfriends in the U.S. is that they're saying, you know what? We get the message loud and clear. We're done protesting. Right. We're not leading the march anymore. We're putting down all the placards because you guys made it very clear as to what you want. Black and brown men, we also heard you very clearly as to what you want, which was Donald Trump. So there's yeah. a, the message I'm hearing from my black girlfriends is, everybody rest, take care of yourself. Wow. We're not doing it yeah. anymore. So I appreciate what these women are doing, but there's a different protest, anti-protest that's going on amongst mm. black women. Oh, that's very interesting. So we'll interesting. see. And you know, you don't know how hard somebody rides for you until they park. So we'll see what happens in the future. Hmm. All right, well, let's move. We'll go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I was just going to say, I know I know a lot of men that like to have sex. And I, <laughs> I know a lot really? of Really? I know a lot of men that want to have, have kids and get married. But I don't know a lot of men who don't want to have women have access to abortion, yeah. to have access to health care. So I'm not naive. I know they exist. But I think it's incumbent upon mm. women to surround ourselves with the type of people we want to be surrounded by. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's a nice note to yeah. Let's move on. So our next question, can you ask your house guests to check their luggage for roaches? Yeah. No. Woman, no, no. It's a mixed, it's a mixed reaction. Listen, no. a woman wrote to the Washington Post advice columnist to ask if it's fair to check friends visiting from New York City, which there are a lot of roaches and rats. Um, so what do you guys think? Can you ask your guests, can I see your bag? 
Cynthia, are you doing this to your house guests? No, I can't imagine doing this. I'm, I, mind you, this is one of my biggest fears. Cockroaches and bed bugs yes. are a huge yeah, yeah. fear of mine. I think they are for many people. But here, I have a story actually related to this. When I was in university, I was living with a girlfriend and we decided to move from one place to another. Mm -hmm. When we got to that place, we found after a few months that there were cockroaches. So we complained to the landlords and the landlords said, you brought them. <gasps> and here's the question. It's kind of like when yes, you smell like... a fart. You can't really yeah. pin <laughs> who the fart. People try. People try all the time. They're like, oh, I know that's probably person did it. But you actually can't pin the fart. And you can't say who brought. No one packs up cockroaches yeah. and brings them along but with I, them. But it's... in this case, I have to say, like, th this couple who's coming to stay with the other couple, they saw baby cockroaches in their apartment. And they kind of pass it off. I think it is reason enough to say, uh, check your stuff. For Simon, it would be reason enough to cancel the trip altogether. You can't even see the stuff. You can, if you have tiny baby you cockroach know what? eggs. I would go so far Ooh. to say is if you knew you had cockroaches or bed bugs, that you should say, hey, like we would in COVID era. Hey, you know what? I've got COVID. I don't think it's a good idea that I come to your place. Hey, I've got bed bugs. I'm not coming to your place. Right. Because do, does anyone well, know how every, much every time you say bed bug and cockroaches, I feel like I need to. Yeah, itch. no. Yeah. Such a gross, those are such gross words. Not just yeah. the itching and the biting and the infestation, but the cost to remove it and yeah. the inconvenience and the time. So I think, uh, yeah, stay at it's home. O it's okay to ask. It's okay to ask. Oh them. yeah. See, I think it's okay to cancel. I have a very unpopular opinion that I don't know, maybe somebody will agree with me. I don't like house guests. Like, you can come for <laughs> dinner. <laughs> I know it's not popular. You're supposed to have an open door. I don't mind you coming for dinner or Is brunch or whatever. Is this the reason why? But here's <laughs> this, this gives me another reason why. <laughs> okay. I already don't like them, but I'm like, if I'm already questioning whether you have roaches in your luggage, I'm sorry, this just for sure, now no one's ever sleeping over. I'll be like, I'm sorry, you just can't. I will pay for your hotel or your Airbnb, <laughs> yeah, by yeah. the way. Like, yeah. I have no problem. I will get you an Uber, I will get you whatever you need, but you're not sleeping over and don't even think about bringing that bag in my house. It's not coming in. <laughs> oh, it's definitely not coming in. <laughs> What makes someone cool? A writer for Esquire. <laughs> <laughs> or not. not Snorty, a writer Snorty for... makes someone yes, cool. No. Uh, a writer for Esquire says she used to think being cool or uncool was in your genes, but now she's trying to make it happen. She's 30 years old. So is that something that you can actually learn to do? Can you become cool later on in life? Really? Because you're so I think, hopeful. Listen, I think the most uncool thing you could try to do is try to be cool. <laughs> if either you are or you aren't, but I think when you're younger, you're really trying to like be cool so you can fit in. And as you get older, you realize it's highly overrated to be cool. And I find myself, as I'm getting older, I don't really care what anybody thinks. I just yeah, yeah, yeah. need to be my authentic self. But I will say this, I do, I do think about this younger generation that's grown up with so much social media where it's in your face when you're not invited to something or you don't have the latest whatever. And I wonder if it's more of a much bigger issue for them. I think every generation has been affected by it. But this generation, I think, is probably thinking more about being cool and fitting in than ever before. I thought your 30s are when you, you, you're you not supposed to care. Like, I thought that was the age where I remember for me, it was like, you, you know, just come I, into we, yourself? Yeah, you just come into yourself. And it's like... Mm. Being cool is so subjective. Like, who decides what's cool? Yeah. Well, you have to say, I have to say, I have cool people in my life, and what makes them oh, Jess, cool... Oh, so nice of you to oh say my that. God. <laughs> I love you, too. But what makes them cool <laughs> is that they have no idea that they're cool. Yeah. They just exude this coolness. You're, it's effortless. It's, they're just there. They're just cool. And you can try to emulate it, but as soon as you try to emulate the cool, you're not cool. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, I do think there's a nuance take, because, like, Donald Trump thinks he's cool, and he is cool, <laughs> and... In, in his circles, for yeah. sure. Because if it's just defined by confidence, like he has that, mm -hmm. and I think there's something more, it is in the eye of the beholder, but there are people who I think we uniformly agree, and I'm thinking women, I'm thinking about Jane Birkin, I'm thinking mm. about Lisa Bonet as two examples of like, and it's that That's effortlessness. effortlessness. Yeah. And it's also an authenticity. I think it's that they, yes. although again, that aligns with the Trump conversation as well, yeah. but it's, it maybe mm. speaks to, I didn't try that hard to put this out together. To me, that was cool. I watch it through my son's eyes though, He's 11, and mm. I see these kids just trying to figure out what it is. And usually there's like an alpha in the group mm -hmm. who's sort of dictating what it is. Yeah. And they usually have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And they usually have a kind of like in his circles, it's sports. Um, yes, I know and exactly it makes the me kid really you're talking sad about. Because again, I'm biased, but my son like plays bass guitar and he's like, he's more of the artsy thing. And mm. I think he's effortlessly cool. But again, I try to remind him that the coolest kids, like the kids who are at the top, they peaked in elementary school. 
it that goes way. downhill from there. Yeah. So you yeah, want yeah, to yeah, that's a great thing to yeah. remember. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, I think you really hit the nail with the authenticity part of it. Like, you know, I, I honestly think authenticity won this election, right? And I think if you really want to influence people, just, and it's so cliche, but I try to tell my kids, be yourself, be how, be your comfortable self. Don't try to be anyone else because it's too hard, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think there's really, there's really something there. That's how authenticity, that's what's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what's cool. Okay. Yeah. Now, speaking of <laughs> we cool, <solved> it. <laughs> speaking of cool, someone wrote to the New York Times fashion uh, critic and asked if ripped jeans will ever go to style Ooh. or if they're forever staple. Now, <laughs> Jess, I don't even know, should I even get you started on this? I understand you have a really clear opinion on this, um, and you're, you might even tear Andrea to shreds. No. Oh no, you, I, oh no. You're gonna hold oh your no. own? Okay, I'm you guys put my ripped jeans on for guys, this one. Go ahead. Guys, I'm more, I'm more passionate about this than I should be, but I'm gonna try to explain why I think ripped jeans and their popularity is symptomatic of where we are right now as a society. Oh, okay. Okay, let's let's time travel. Let's time, I know, they're rolling your eyes with the people with the ripped jeans. You hear me out, you hear me out. <laughs> let's have an let's open imagine, mind. Let's imagine that one of our ancestors comes back in time and, they're, and, and they ask you for advice on buying two pairs of jeans. They're like, which pair should I buy? This pair's $100. Oh, they're new and they have no holes in them. Or should I buy this pair for 100, maybe even $110? But they're imperfect. They have holes in them the ancestor would say oh I'll take the new ones with no holes mm -hmm. and then you'd say but these ones are, are more in style and they would say but why are they more in style it's like they're more in style because ripped worn in jeans the authentic ones they bear this allure of things that we really like in society they say we've we've worn these for a long, long time they say we have holes in them because I worked <laughs> they say they say authenticity right right and then your grandma would say well doesn't that make the the jeans with no holes inauthentic and you would say yeah it does because we are a culture of inauthenticity oh, okay. and they convenience because they we didn't work are, for it because they didn't, we work, didn't for it. work for it we okay. want everything everything instantaneously. We want to order our dinner from a restaurant that's two, maybe two blocks away from us <laughs> because we're so lazy. And we want it delivered by a bike courier who makes minimum wage. Yeah. And that bike courier is going to use a bike lane. And we hate the bike lanes because we can't drive our cars. Wow. But the bike lanes, wow. but the bike lanes wow. not wow. save that courier's life. Wow. But we're so lazy and entitled. We want our dinner and we're so lazy and entitled. How we do we end up in the jeans. bike lane? How do we end up in the bike lane? It's like six degrees of ripped jeans. Like, I, I feel like you can, you're getting every day into symptomatic like. symptomatic of this whole thing that we're going through. We are so lazy and entitled. We don't want to work for the holes in our but jeans. But maybe how about it's just, okay, well, how about this thought? How about it's just a style? Like, if we use that And theory, I say we because I'm included. Okay, how about we use, okay, I'm going to use your theory. Okay, see, I bring back one of my ancestors, and she's like, so let me understand something. You have hair on your head, but you're wearing somebody else's hair on your head. What? <laughs> your head, but you're paying to have somebody else's hair and you're wearing it on your head. It's like, yes, but it's the style. Yeah. It's, it's just the thing it's of the, the moment. It's just the thing of the moment, but can you imagine our ancestors looking back on us? But maybe it's thinking, a testament about imperfection. Well, maybe it's like, I yes, actually desire the less the thing that is absolutely perfect. I'm interested in the flaws. Not so much what the flaws mean. But flaws tell a story. Don't you want to wear the ripped jeans I know, that you've had for 20 years? I just bought, here's the deal. I just bought a pair of ripped jeans, pre-loved ripped jeans that oh, are men men's jeans and that's they have different. a huge rip in the crotch and that those jeans tell a story yes you're now, saving I'm, them from a landfill you didn't pay good top money and that's what i'm trying to a pair of jeans I, so the, i'm talking about the pair of jeans you go into a you store you mean the 400 dollars pair yes they're why do they cost more i don't understand this because why the, do they're less material it's like thongs why do thongs cost more <laughs> they have less the material is rigged. and it makes no sense the system is rigged it's rigged <laughs> there's hope for us guys there's hope for us <laughs> So China Phillips and husband Billy Baldwin are opening up about their decision to live in separate homes. China revealed on their YouTube channel that they meet up for date nights, therapy and dinner with the kids, but need time apart because they have, quote, an allergy to each other, unquote. <laughs> so is this a healthy solution or the beginning of the end, having different homes in different cities? Mm. <laughs> I feel like this 
this is, I was like, oh, I feel like this is already happening though to, with people. And maybe it's not different homes in different cities, but I can talk about my parents and their generation. Um, like they, they stay in the same house, but they have two separate bedrooms with two separate TVs. So my dad can watch BNN, my mom can watch her Indian soap operas. <laughs> and they can, but they meet for dinner and yeah. they like, you know, but they, ha they have their own space. And I think as a relationship grows, you need that. Or if your partner s uh, snores, I'm sure there's people yeah. watching us who sleep in a separate bed. So I think that's a healthy distance. I personally am at the stage in my life and my marriage where I really like coming home to my husband. Yeah. Like I yeah. like that. It's yeah. just he's home to me, right? Yeah. He's like my home. Yeah. And so for me, I don't know if that would, if he might say, yeah, yeah, I would love to do that because I'm always <laughs> like, mm. but, but you know, I like that. That's personal, yeah. I feel like uh, there's, uh, I'm interested in this as a conversation piece because there's a whole movement that's growing. They call themselves A partners or LATs, living apart together. Mm -hmm. And it's been growing for a while. There are Facebook groups now. There's a few books out there. And I think it just kind of normalizes this idea that there's not one way to exist in a, in a, in a partnership. I think there's a lot of different maybe considerations. Like you have to do more work at communication. I think it could be a nightmare in terms of scheduling. I think if you have young children, mm -hmm. it's never oh, gonna yeah. work. Yeah. But people like Sarah Paulson recently talked on Smartness yeah. about the fact yeah. that her and her partner live apart. Mm -hmm. um, they've been together for ages, they love it. Um, Diane von Furstenberg famously, she's in New York, she's been with her husband for 20 years. She always is kind of like, I don't understand why people find this so difficult. They have date nights, they connect. And in a way, doesn't it sound kind of amazing? Like that there's a little bit of sort of, you'd have to have money, maybe not in your parents. Yeah. Yeah. Thing, yeah. But yeah. generally, yeah. Well, you're or looking at me, place, but you're preaching right? to the choir. Like, right. no way. <laughs> 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 yes. Perfect husband. Well, you're not in his own house. No one's allowed to keep you house anyway. love. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm anyway. afraid of his roaches. No, but my perfect <laughs> husband. <laughs> has his own space and we we realize that we're individuals who when it comes to our like comfort level when we get home we want that silence we don't I don't want to have to deal with your pee on this toilet seat I don't want to have to tell you to pick things up I want you to be comfortable though in your own space but it's very interesting when we we promoted this before the break I saw a lot of women doing this because ah! I think there's a lot of like work that comes with living with somebody where you're like, can you do this? Can you empty this? Why didn't you see to do this? And I think that would help a lot of marriages. Cause I'll say this as the only single um, person on this panel. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will fight for someone to stay married. And if this is what they have to do to stay together, mm. I'm like, fine, live in separate houses, but work on your relationship and try to stay together. Because I think there are a lot of people who are divorcing for reasons that afterwards they're like, maybe we could have worked through that and we just needed a break from each other, mm. not necessarily to divorce one another. So I'm pro this as long as it can keep people together longer. Yeah. I, okay, let me try to play the other side. If because I view this as something that's happening when couples, their kids are grown up and they've left uh, and they have more time and more space. Maybe they're retired. For me, if your husband or your wife is still peeing on the seat and not picking up <laughs> after them and you've been together for 40 or 50 years, I think you have a bigger problem. Like I, I do think, like, for me, this would signal the beginning of the end. Okay. Mm. Like, really? I can understand separate bedrooms. I can understand separate TVs. But living in a, in living separately in two separate homes in different cities cities and referring to someone as like I never want to feel allergic to Simon. Yeah. I, I, I know just, but you and I Simon have something very unique. You guys share a double bed. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let me tell you, I told you I've, that loved, I've, I've loved a lot of people, but I've never loved someone that much. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have a unique union where you love being very close to each other, even in your slumber. This is true. This is true. <laughs> it's really adorable. It's That's very cute. Oh, my God. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. <laughs> it's very cute. You, you have nothing else? <laughs> We're just gonna leave it at double bed fine. All right, she's pointing to the prompt right now. To fashion now. <clears throat> For a lot of us, new tights bring up memories of dance recitals and Sunday mass. But now that big stars like Sabrina Carpenter are wearing them, they're making a comeback, everybody. All right, so are you into the nude tights? Are you into it? Okay, so some, some, yeah, so. some trepidatious like, class. I am so into this mm -hmm. idea. I remember growing up and my mom had a whole drawer full of like, they were more like nylons, nylon. not so much the shiny <laughs> tights, but you remember the ones that came in an egg and they were stretchy mm, and whatever. Yes. And it was just a standard that you put on nylons to go about your day. And then at some point in time, I don't, no one gave me the memo, that it switched over to Bare Leg City. And for anyone who has a slight blemishes or a lot of blemishes or veins or weirdness, it just kind of like, you feel very, very exposed. So bring back this slick, they're shiny, they're, they look like they even hold you in. I, who else is, come on, you're in. You want them to be here? Why not? They remind me of, they, I think they're fine. 
fine for the royal family or for figure <laughs> skaters, but I just don't see in everyday life like you have great legs well, though. <laughs> you do have nice. really, really good games. Nice. Don't talk about my personal life with my double bed and my grand life. <laughs> so it's sad, sad they're hidden. But you know, it's interesting though. We have to admit they're doing it on stage though. Yeah, Are they that's doing true. this in real life? I don't know. Right? I don't like know. in stage, it looks really on stage. But I'm with you. Anything that can help me make my yes. legs look longer and, and golden. Yeah, like no, this, I'm going to buy them in bulk. This is tied to a child. Yeah. I know it's going to sound a, a little extreme, but this is uh, tied to a childhood trauma of <laughs> going to church on Sundays. And you know, if you're going to church, you have to have your tights on. And um, the manufacturers of these tights never quite get the brown shade right. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that is so, so there's correct. There's always like a grayish tinge. Yeah. 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 Fair. Which, you know, it's fair. fine when you're 74. Yeah. <laughs> But when you're a young 12-year-old girl yeah. on your way to church with a gray leg and it's kind of, like, uncomfortable, I, I say no to the nude tight. I'm not here. Unless you're on stage entertaining the fans yeah. and you need to, like, not have people take pictures of your cellulite, put on your shiny tights, and that's where it belongs. But in these streets, please do not do it. Just put some lotion. I'm okay yeah. with a spider vein yeah. and a dimple here or there. All right. no, I'm no, no. just really relieved we agree on the nude tights. We can disagree on ripped jeans. Yeah, America, 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 Subscribe to The Social Podcast so you don't miss a fiery debate. Until next time, socialites.